my glass here, sipping on some Chardonnay tonight. Felt a little like I wanted a little sweeter, a little, you know, Chardonnay is not really that sweet, but I wanted something different than my usual Pinot Noirs and Merlots. So what are you sipping on tonight? And hopefully we'll hear all of you join. Um, so anyhow, happy Wine Wednesday. Hope your Wednesday is fabulous and your seahorses are fabulous too. Um, tonight we had planned on this. Uh oh, I'm echoing guys. Somebody turned me off on YouTube. Okay. Welcome, welcome. I did put up a link on YouTube to show how to join the stream. We think it's a lot easier. We may change the fact that you have to be a Seahorse Source Group member, but for the time being, it's working really well. So let me know what you guys think in the comments. We had planned tonight to talk about Seahorse Safe Coral. And I had a bunch of images ready and I had my research ready to talk to you guys about it. We can still talk to, about that if you'd like when you join in the room. But my special guest, who actually really focuses in on this topic, was unable to make it tonight. And therefore, I kind of put off that topic for another week so that we can make sure we had him here to share his expertise. Um, Rob, call me, please. And... Uh, so anyways, we thought that tonight I would we would talk about the coloration of seahorses, whether or not this is something that you can actually breed into seahorses, and we have Dan, who is the king of the piebald seahorse, seahorses with us tonight. So we're going to talk about what that means. But just in the spirit of testing new things and trying new things, I wanted to make sure you guys could see if I put up a quick... I think it's working. If you guys can see my piebald seahorses on the screen, you let me know. And the Dan can give us a more scientific definition in just a moment. But basically, piebald seahorses, ha, you know, have a loss of pigmentation, and therefore they look like they have white or silvery patches all over them. Dan's going to give us the, the real deal here in just a second. But I wanted to show mine off let you guys know what we're talking about and anyone can feel free to join the room in seahorse sources group and uh, show off your own pictures or tell us what you think or have any questions i have lots of questions about piebald so we're about done with my oops there's a fuzzy picture we're about done with my little screenplay here but as you can see the piebald seahorses look beautiful and they just have a very extraordinarily unique appearance so we're gonna Stop the uh, slideshow now. Glad to see it can work. Yay. And, okay, maybe we're going to stop it. Let's see. <laughs> okay, there we go. All right, and we have Dan and Ray with us. Now, one more thing before we get to talking is that if you do join the room, we would love, you know, at, at this first break in conversation for you to let everyone know who you are, if you're willing. Because, you know, as people pop in, it's difficult to keep track of who's who. And we want to, I, last week I did a really crappy job of introducing people. So, so far we have Ray and Dan today and someone I think just joined. But Dan, now that I'm done rambling, can you tell us what a piebald seahorse actually is? What's the difference? It's not a species. What is it? Piebald is simply uh, means two colors. Okay. So, so in other words, it's a. It originates from the the horses. The mustangs were piebalds. Thus, the not mustangs. The um, pintos were piebald horses. The reason that uh, Ocean Rider called them pintos, and all of us have chosen not to fight with. Uh, Ocean Rider over naming conventions, so we just call them what they really are, which is piebald. There's actually another name for three colors, but I, I can't remember that. But it just simply means that it's two colors. Okay. Typically on a seahorse, on a seahorse it usually shows up as an area of white, which basically is an area where there's no coloration versus the rest of the area that has color. Gotcha. And I'm guessing that you're not going to tell us your trick to uh, getting seahorses to become piebald, but is it a genetic thing? Is it based on, I mean, what, what causes a seahorse to become piebald or have two colors or whatnot? Well, based on my um, experiments and having done them for a while, I don't believe that it's genetic. I believe that it's controlled by external factors and, um, like many of the other things with seahorses, the cirri, the color, the markings, etc., all of those are subject to change with uh, seahorses. 
and the piebald thing is subject to change. Sometimes you'll see it develop um, in a tank. Sometimes you'll get them and see it go away. Um, in some cases, I've seen it go away and come back. So it can go either way. It can happen at, at virtually any age and can go away at any age. And it's just it's just a unique-looking seahorse. I can't figure out how to get my bloody screen to share. Oh, <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna walk you through in just a second. But so basically the bottom line is they're really cool, but they don't all stay that coloration. And we're gonna talk about color in just a second. But guys, remember we're trying this out. So well, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, yeah, it you know the the piebald thing is, you know, obviously desirable because everybody wants something a little bit different, but it's one of those things where you don't know if it's going to stay just as you don't know what color the seahorses are going to be and if they're going to stay. Mm. And with, it's one of those things where you hope so, but you just don't know for sure. Okay, really quick. If you, uh, I don't know what you're on right now, but if you arrow over the bottom of the room call, there should be the very first uh, little circle. Um, it shows like two papers on top of each other, it looks like. That's your screen share. Yeah. Click it. And then, okay, I did that, and then? Okay, we're going to practice together, guys. You're going to see my screen for a second. Okay, so on the video, you should see this. So you can either share your entire screen, or you choose an application window, and then you can choose, you know, like if you have an image pulled up, you can show that image. Does that make sense? All right, let's see. Okay, well, I have an image pulled up, but is it showing it? No. <laughs> Let, uh, I think I have an image okay. pulled up. Yeah. We're trying, guys. We're just trying. To, he's trying to show us what he's talking about here. I'm going to try again too. Application window, Chrome tab. So, like, if I wanted to show you guys something, um, like now you see my whole screen. But I'm gonna I'm gonna stop doing that because that's silly. But yeah. All right. But it's not. Uh... I'm flipping back and forth between the two. Hmm. When I first hit the button, I get a small screen at the bottom. If I touch that screen, it goes up. Um, Are you on an iPad, perchance? Yes. Hmm. Yes, I am. I don't have an iPad, so I can't even try to help you. Um, anyone in the audience or anyone who's joined, if you have any clues, clue us in because we want to see Dan's pictures for sure. Um, the other thought, Dan, as we go, because guys, we're still testing this theory out to see if the room works, is uh, I got my little guy here for support and my seahorse. But anyways, uh, what you could try, Dan, is um, if you leave and come back through a phone or a computer, That I mean, I'm just thinking of suggestions, but because I don't know how to do it. Marina came back week. What was it, Ray? Marina came back this week. Yes, this we're, week. we're so glad to have Marina. Love it. Hello. So glad you can Welcome. join us. Thank you. Glad to be here. Looking forward to it. Yes. In fact, uh, Marina, I have a question for you while Dan plays with this and tries to figure it out. Have you um, ever had for either piebald seahorses or have you witnessed your seahorses change colors? Um, my adult seahorses? Sure, any. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've seen massive color different um color changes in my adult seahorses. I think it's based on their surroundings. Um I find in quarantine I use a lot of orange and red and yellow hitches and they tend to stay orange and yellow and really bright colors. And I've seen them get really dark when they go into um my display tent which has a lot more just like i guess it's rock so whites and browns and green corals and purple corals so i think that might have something to do with them but i've seen like one of my adult um tutors has gone from yellow to black to white to yellow wow <laughs> yellow to black to white to yellow i love it and that's and and are you uh i'm so sorry i didn't check before we got um streaming but you're are you in australia is that correct in melbourne okay i just wondered because i know that kuda are really big um and it's harder to get them around here so lucky you <laughs> but 
Um, have you ever noticed, uh, we've had debated this before, and that's why I love when new people join and, you know, share their own experiences. Have you ever uh, witnessed or had the thought that, like, lighting had anything to do with it? Or has it always been just, like, the color of the decorations around the sealers? Or coral? Uh, my fr <clears throat> friend Brett has theorized that it has to do, try to do with the color. I've run a little bit of an experiment and actually put um, orange fluorescent paper around the glass of the tank. And that actually reflected the light to be more of an orange color. Mm -hmm. And that definitely um, helps them keep the sort of yellows and oranges. But obviously I can't have paper around the tank long term. It was more of a little, um, little experiment. But yeah, I think it's just in general the color of their what's around them. I think um, the really big heavy blue lights that a lot of people use for coral probably don't bring out the prettiest colors horses, but I don't think it affects their health any sort of thing. Okay, um, you broke up just a little bit and I think what you were saying was really key. So uh, you don't have to repeat the whole thing, but what did you, did you say something about blue light or blues or did I mishear you? I think that the heavy blue lights that a lot of people didn't use um, the reef tanks and for coral um, tend not to bring out the brighter colors. Um, I don't really have any science or anything behind that. That's just been a bit of um, an observation. I think yellow and sort of more white light um, makes them sort of lighter colors. But, um, pretty much all of my seahorses have changed the color from the color I got them and they often change um, one of my males in particular goes quite white whenever he mates I, I caught everything but the last line you said but the white like, I'm so sorry <laughs> it's just breaking up a little bit I'm not sure sorry. no it's um, I just said that um one male in particular, a, a male member, he goes very white, very pale whenever he sleeps. So I'm not sure if it has something to do with their mood as well. I think you said a male in particular it really changed color and you're not sure if it has to do with the mood and like maybe the sex. Is that what you were getting at? Uh, yeah. Kind so whenever of. He, he turns white. Yeah, that's really interesting i've seen my seahorses turn extremely white uh, oh I, you know what i know exactly what you're talking about now it's when they get really excited i've done multiple videos showing them turn extremely like this bright white color when they're excited when they're um i call it jousting with other males or flirting with other females i've definitely seen the males turn that bright white color but if your male stayed white i would have to agree with you that it was probably due to like the surroundings and etc i know that when i put um quite a few of my seahorses i moved them from a macroalgae tank that had a lot of different colors and a lot of different just everything into a um, display tank that had a lot of like you were describing rocks and just green and red type macroalgae, they all, every single one of them turned a silver, I don't know what, I don't know how else to say it, color. And um, Marina, we, we love when you come and we want you to always keep coming back. Who cares if it, you know, if we can't hear you sometimes, we want you here. But just to, if you are, are you watching this while you're um, talking or no? Yes. Okay, just if you're watching it on the same device, obviously you know to mute it. Um, the only other thing that I might suggest, because we want you always here, <laughs> well, we want to hear what you say, is maybe watch on a separate device with the volume turned down. But you're good. Not, I'm just trying to make it easier for you too. You know, so. Um, but yeah. The seahorses. I'm, I'm not watching on another device. I'm just in the group. Oh, okay. All right, well, then it may just be the connection. It could be even even on my end. But we just want to make sure we hear everything you say because we love when you come. And everything you just said, I completely agree with. You know, I've seen the same changes. I never know the science behind it. I love your experiment of putting the orange paper around the tank 
I'd never heard of that. One of the things that we recommend, and I know Dan has recommended multiple times, is putting blue colored paper around the tank. That seems to bring out the yellows. In fact, Dan, do you have any thoughts? Because I know, um, Dan, you've said before that you tried like red decorations and red uh, colored things and that turned them black. So it's interesting to me that she, her experiment with orange was successful. Any thoughts? Well, yellow and orange uh, generally can work. Um, not always, but uh, sometimes the orange will pull the orange. And yellow, of course, will pull the yellow as blue will pull the yellow or generally make them more colorful. Is it something to do with like the, the color wheel, like that kind of thing or no? I, I don't know. Um, but, you know, sometimes when you put a color in the tank, you get unexpected results. And the seahorse is trying to blend in. And I suspect that their ability to match certain colors, since they can't, they go to something else. And it just, it creates a you know, unintended uh, color, if you will. Sure. And very quickly, I want to say, Ray, I see you uh, screen sharing. Got any tricks to teach us? Yeah. When I click on that share the screen, I get a window pops up. It says share your screen. And Messenger wants to share contents through the screen. You can choose what you'd like. And it has your entire screen application window that when I click on that, it's showing my inbox. For, uh, Thunder, Thunderbird email and then when I click on Chrome tab it shows all the tabs that are open on uh, in Chrome and then uh, I can click on any one of those and then it will come up like I can put on uh, the YouTube uh, yeah you're okay. showing the YouTube right <laughs> look there we are <laughs> look at that so um, I'm just really wondering if it's not just. So I can open up any tab that I, that I have. I can share that. I can share my email. I don't know what else will come under that tab. I saw the weather. Uh, but maybe. <laughs> well, it might, um, it might be, um, the iPad. We'll give Dan more time to try to figure it out because we desperately want to see his pictures. Very quickly, I wanted to say hi, Annette. Um, hi, Mermaid's Reef. It was your youngest birthday, so you don't want to <laughs> get the sugar high children in the stream. No problems. <laughs> We'd love to have you guys, but I understand. And Philosophish, hello. So happy you're here again. Blair, um, it's not about being smart. It's about loving seahorses and continuing to work with them and, you know, figure things out. We've got some people like Ray and Dan that joined the stream that have been doing this for years and actually breed seahorses and then we've got hobbyists I'm not sure where Marina falls in this but I know that I still consider myself a hobbyist we're all seahorse whisperers you know because we love them and we just keep working with them and figuring things out I think it's so cool that even hobbyists are doing experiments to try to figure new things out but yeah thank you um, and darned iPads right gotcha just check in the comments real quick and uh, Dan, did you want to, um, uh, are you still playing with the screen share or did you want to maybe tell us a little bit more about the experiment you're conducting right now with the minis? Um, I'm still trying to figure this bloody damn thing out. Okay. So my mind is uh, elsewhere at the moment. Okay, no problems. Okay, all right, well, Ray, I'll, I'll jump to you for a second and I'll try to, I'm trying to conduct five things at the same time, guys, but I'll try to make it to where we see Ray only for a second. Okay, so Ray, um, how big of sw uh, swings in seahorse coloration have you noticed? Like, had, do your seahorses, because I know s different species seem to, I did, actually before, sorry, I'm rambling, but before I ask the question, I did a video a long time ago um, that like really dug into the research behind coloration and the melanin fours and and what causes seahorses to change color and I realized and I was talking with Dan earlier about the fact that certain species seem to have a wider range of colors that they can change versus some um, species just simply you know are either black or silver or white where some can be bright red and etc so the species that you keep Ray my question is have you noticed big color changes often well the abs have never shown any color change 
the barbs basically go from uh, a nice brown to uh, a very light uh, sort of brownish yellow. The red eye, um, they were probably the second most uh, changeable. Uh, and depending on the seahorse, it might have been, uh, most of the times it was shades of red and orange. Wow. Cool. That it would change to, but uh, then most of the time they weren't that color. Most of the time they were, uh, uh, I guess, brown, brownish black and that. Sure. Uh, probably the one that they ever changed the most for me was Angustus. Really? And they went. But that's a lot of years. And did they go to those wide changes like red and yellow and crazy colors? Uh, they had uh, the one that uh, turned yellowish uh, really made uh, a real yellow. Um, trying to think the other one that went the most. I wish Lucy was here because I know she's done a lot of playing with uh, changing seahorse color and she has a couple of extremely yellow erectus of all thing, things that just never change. They stay that bright yellow, beautiful color. So it's, which is just crazy to me because my experience has always been every seahorse I've ever had has changed colors often when they're excited, as Marina pointed out, turning that lighter white <laughs> bright color. Oh, what are we, what are we seeing here? Dan, what are you showing us? That's one of my. Oh, hang on. Let me move. That's one of them. Let me hang on. Don't don't go away from it because I had Ray up. Sorry, Ray. Oh, you we lost it. <laughs> oh, no. That's okay. Oh, you're showing on the phone. <laughs> Whatever works, right? <laughs> Whatever works. That's one of them. It's in the process of changing. And um, this is the other one. This is one of the males. The other was a female. It's like do it with it's not blind it out and so and if you didn't know better the thing that happens though you have to watch is a lot of times when I get people that call me and say their seahorse is sick and it's got an infection and you look at the seahorse you know I can look at the seahorse sometimes and tell like for example on this one if you didn't know better um, turn it where it's not there we go those white patches are not an infection. It's where it's becoming a piebald. Right. How would you know that? I can usually tell by looking. Um, it, you know, there's certain characteristics you look for with the with a uh, bacterial infection. And the other thing is is what the seahorse is doing. The actual, you know, this guy is running around the tank, being acting normal and everything else. But, you know, if he was off his food and lethargic and had a big old white patch, I might be concerned. But this one has patches on both sides. Um, they're, they're almost unilateral. So that tells me that it's not bacterial. Okay, good point. So in other words, when it's bacterial, you won't see it equally on both sides. That makes sense. Um, go ahead. I've never had five old uh, coloration on any seahorse in 18 years. How, now how, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm going to go back to uh, grid mode so we can see you both. And uh, just, just a comment very quickly before you respond, Dan, is that um, for anyone who does want to join the room, as Marina has done, obviously you can come in and out as you please. It's, um, you know, you can come and go as you please. So keep coming and going. All right, go ahead, Dan. Wh why do you think he's never seen a pie ball in 19 years? Well, I don't think his tank is conducive to producing them. So it is an environment. Well, well, yeah. Sorry, go what, Ray? I, I can create... Go ahead, Ray. Yeah, I've got lots of different tanks. And the only thing I ever did that uh, where a change happened when I made the change was when uh, I uh, painted the back of them uh, sky blue. It brought, uh, it made them, uh, the colors brighter. Like the reds came out more yet red, the yellows were more yellow and uh, they didn't go to the the standard brown, they didn't change back into that uh, as much. Oh, the other thing is, if I, the more live rock I put in with them, the darker they get. I agree. And Dan, what were you going to say in response to 18 years? Or, I'm sorry. Um, Go ahead. 
Well, I just I just don't think his tank is conducive to creating pie balls or the environment, I should say. Um, so it is an environmental thing. It's not genetic. It's you're making this happen. Is that correct? I believe that is correct. I've uh, been experimenting. I decided to do this about a month ago, and it takes me a couple of months to get them to where I want them. I cannot believe. I mean, you're an excellent breeder, and I looked on uh, Alyssa's Seahorse Savvy's page and her description of piebalds because they also have them, but she explains that she only gets a couple every few years. They're so unique. She may have, uh, you know, gone, gone further than that at this point. I haven't talked to her recently, but I think it's incredible that you guys can literally make seahorses, you know, be, have patches. Well, if, if, if the piebalds was a genetic thing, with all the piebalds that I've sold, somebody would have bred them and had more piebalds. True. And if you'll notice, nobody is. And that's the first clue to me that it's not genetic. The second thing is, is that I've intentionally created them and I get anywhere from five to 25% of a batch turned to piebald. Wow. And I've done that with three different species. I've done it with the erectus. I, well, actually four. I've done it with the uh, dwarfs. I've done it with the Cuda and I've done it with the red eye. Wow. And so, but I, I know you're not going to tell us all the tricks and tips here, uh, breeder secret, but the bottom line is you have to start when they're very young. I'm or no, 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 no. Wow. Uh, these guys, the guys that I'm doing right now, they were born April a year ago. And, um, it was in the beginning of May that I decided to see if I could turn these guys into pie balls. That's so incredible. Someday, you guys, he's going to write a book and we're all going to learn his, his secrets. <laughs> but until then, um, so you're turning these minis into piebalds. Are you, are, are they coming up for sale or? Well, at the moment, I'm not selling the piebalds. And one of the ones that I sold turned into a piebald after the customer received it. Wow. Um, so um, I'm, I'm waiting to see you know, where I get with it before I do anything. I've got two that have that are technically piebald and I have a couple of others that are on the verge of becoming, I can see where they're starting to change. They haven't changed yet, but I can see the beginnings of it. Very cool. I mean, I, I just wish I had the experience and knowledge that you do because that is very cool. Well, the thing to remember is, is that with seahorses, I mean, they have some weird genes to them that, uh, trying to everybody tries to breed different things you know if you remember a while back somebody was trying to breed uh i forgot what she called them um all white seahorses they should have a special name for them and people try to breed for color people try to breed for cirri people try to breed for certain patterns you know i i've seen a paisley pattern on a seahorse because of decorations um the patterns can change the saddle markings can come and go the lines can come and go um, the various different markings, the colors can change. Um, you know, I, sometimes they can come up with some weird colors. I've seen a purple se seahorses. Um, I had I've a purple seahorse. I had one myself. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. I, I've seen them a green color, mm -hmm. you know, um, I've always liked the, the, uh, canary yellow. That was always my favorite. Oh yeah. And, you know, for a long time I was producing them that way on purpose. But the problem is, is that you can sell them that way and you can pay extra for color, but that doesn't mean it's going to stay that way. Exactly. And that's been, uh, you know, I'm so, I was so glad when, uh, Seahorse Savvy began selling Rita. I don't, I don't know if they have any currently in stock, but mine were from her. I actually got some from you too, but, um, I was just happy about that because the Rita online that you see, you know, you can't, because I don't know the, the sellers, I never know if they're actually captive bred and there's, let me ask you this way. If you see red eye online for sale that are the really exotic colors, in my opinion, red eye in the species that I've personally had interaction with, red eye have always been the most colorful. And if you see the really exotic colored and patterned seahorses, does that typically mean that they're not captive bred? And why are they so much more colorful when they're not captive bred? My suspicion is diet. Okay. Um, I think they get more of what they need in the wild setting, uh, especially with, you know, the, the live feed that are feeding on other things. 
I think there's certain supplements that are probably missing in the frozen mice's diet. Gotcha. And are we getting closer? Is diet maybe have something to do with your breeding expertise skills <laughs> or no? I know I need no, to. No, <laughs> this is, yeah, this isn't diet induced. Um, okay. The, the thing is to remember is that in the wild setting, you know, sometimes people try to give different enrichments. They give huffas, they give this, but there's a lot of micronutrients that are available through live foods, partially in that, um, certain enzymes and stuff that are in them, but also they'll feed upon different types of algaes and other creatures. So there's a lot of little micronutrients that are, they're getting in a wild diet that they're not getting in the captive diet. And we really don't have a complete means of making that up as we speak. And you can supplement with live foods, but just because you supplement with live foods, if they're not eating a wild diet, you're still not getting the, the same micronutrients. Sure. And, you know, you can, you know, add some nature rose and you can add some uh, spirulina and, and, you know, some different forms of algae that you gut load in the stuff. And that probably helps, but still, you're not going to get the same thing as you get from a wild diet. Sure. Well, and uh, one last question about um, just, you know, the wild caught or the seahorses in the ocean. Everyone, I know a lot of people disagree with me, but like I was talking with uh, Marina earlier about color change, I just think lighting does play a part. And couldn't the, it play a part based on the fact that the seahorses are typically in more shallow waters and closer to the light kind of thing? Or is that just still something sure, you disagree sure with? Okay. No, I, I've played with lighting, and lighting can certainly have an impact. I've changed my fluorescent lighting from um, a warm color to a natural sunlight color. And that made a difference. Um, you know, I think you can have too much of one spectrum of light or not enough of a certain spectrum and that can impact it. And the, the perfect lighting, I think will vary from tank to tank based upon, you know, the position of the light, how strong it is, how deep the water is, how clear the water is and what's in the tank. So, what is perfect lighting for one tank may not be perfect lighting for another tank in sure. terms of getting the seahorses to do a certain color. Sure. Um, but I do think lighting can make a big difference in terms of their brightness of the colors. Not so much the changing of the color, but in terms of the brightness. Sure. Okay. I, I mean, I, and I agree, obviously. Um, I just, one of the other videos that I had done literally shows a seahorse that I raised from birth here. And maybe, you know, age plays a part too. I just, I don't know enough to say for sure, but changing the lighting made a huge impact. So I've, I've also had a, um, totally off the subject, but also had a seahorse that I'm still to this day convinced aborted his, one of his batches of fry because of a lighting change that I think was way too intense. So I just think lighting plays a big part. So I like to bring it up and question you guys. Ray, yeah, I, you okay? I don't. Sorry. That's the stupid phone. Oh. <laughs> I, you know, I said I, like, uh, one with weather uh, alerts. Uh, oh. You sure. know, for really severe uh, weather conditions. Sure. They send out the, alert, the alerts and it goes on the TV and it goes on your phone. Everywhere. It goes, sure. It's a nuisance, but I guess they, the powers that be think it saves lives. We won't argue with the powers that be this this stream, but I <laughs> I will say um, just another thought, uh, Dan. I know you want to respond. I'm, I'm about to let you, but another thought is I, I'm putting you way on the spot today. But maybe in the future, if you're more prepared, the other thing, if you can't screen share, is you could you literally use your camera to if you were to go into your room, which I know you don't want to do that right now. I'm just saying in the future, you could show us as you have before um, the pie balls. But go ahead with your response to what you. Were, what you were going to respond with. Sorry. The thing that I don't understand is, is that when I go out in the lagoon and, you know, I spent several years out there daily looking at what was going on and some of that shallow water with that sun beating down at noontime was really, really intense lighting. And I don't get, you know, I don't understand the differences enough uh, between the real light and artificial light and the brightness and the impact it has on the seahorses. Right. You know, it, you know, from what I see out in nature, that, that light out there is much more intense than what most people have on their tanks. 
But what I will say that I've also noticed is that when you put a seahorse in a tank that has pretty intense lighting, while they're a bit thrown off at first, quite often they adapt to it and they do just fine with it. Right. I know. Right. They do adapt to it. And absolutely. Okay. So um, anyone that's watching the stream or anyone that chooses to jump in, always remember, you can ask any questions about anything, even if we're talking about color this week. If you have something else you want answered or need to share, you're always welcome. But guys, uh, just to kind of really complete the conversation about color, what have we missed? What We've talked about how the environment affects, affects color, how you shouldn't buy seahorses for their color um, because it can, it can and will typically change. Ray covered some of the species that he's owned that don't change as much. Um, what else do we need to discuss about color or piebald, Dan? I know I didn't give you much time to talk that through. Um, well, I agree you shouldn't buy based on color, but if I decide to sell the piebalds, um, I will be charging more money for it. <laughs> sure. Um, but I'll also put a disclaimer that, you know, they are the color The color may change back to normal. Sure. It may not. So, you know, we've had, there's people that have posted pictures of it uh, staying as a piebald, but there's also those that have changed back to normal coloration. Mine stayed. And mine, uh, those pictures were old, folks. I didn't have time to get great new pictures. But mine stayed the same. And it, actually, they gained more colors, but they kept their white splotches, if that Pie makes sense. Yeah, the piebald pattern. The piebald pattern. Thank you. Good, good way to express it. Um, so, yeah, anybody watching or anyone uh, who owns piebalds, what have yours done? I, I wish uh, Lisa was here because I know she had quite a few. Um, and Lucy, you know, guys, even if you can't come during the stream, comment later, you know, so we can talk about it another time. Or you can maybe come next time. Uh, okay, so what other things about color? Go ahead, Marina. Just a, qu uh, just a question. Mm -hmm. um, do you guys think that maybe the seahorse is also color? depending on the color of the other seahorses? Yes, absolutely. And I think what happens is is that um, it can be for multiple reasons. Part of it could be a mating thing. Part of it can be that you sometimes have what's called what I call a dominant seahorse that influences the other seahorses. Um, and sometimes I think it's going with the flow with the rest of the guys. I mean, if you put, if you've got a tank full of... Um, say yellow seahorses you put one seahorse then it's a different color sure. quite often that seahorse will match with the others unless it's a dominant seahorse and then the rest of the seahorses turn dark like him oh, that makes sense that's quite interesting how they, they change I, I used to sometimes move seahorses around seeing if i could influence color by moving colorful seahorses into another tank where they weren't as colorful. And it's weird because sometimes I can take two tanks that are almost identical. They're both round tubs. They both have the same lighting. They have the same filtration scheme. Their setups are essentially identical. And if I take the seahorses from tank A, put them in tank B, sometimes I can take them to where they're colorful and they lose their color or vice versa, where they're not colorful and they become colorful in the next tank. And Technically, you know, the water quality is the same. Um, it is different water because it's a separate system. But, you know, as far as everything I can measure, it's all the same. Gotcha. Um, I'm curious. Oh, I'm sorry, Marina, if I, if I cut you off, I'll ask very quickly. Um, I'm curious about what we were talking about earlier, uh, Dan or Ray or Marina. Um, but what Marina and I were discussing earlier about how when the males get excited, I, I've just noticed this ex especially in males, um, but also in females sometimes, but mainly males, when they get excited, when they're courting, when they're um, fighting or what whatnot, they turn that pale white color. Is this like um, the, is obviously that's a more, more of an emotional response, but anybody have any idea why their color seems to drain when they're excited or fearful? Well, it's supposed to be flashing. It's supposed to be grabbing the female's attention. I mean, oh. you see that with other animals too. Okay. You know, it's 
kind of like the the young the young teenager that got his shirt off flexing his muscle in front of the girls trying to get their attention. Got it's, it. You know. Okay, so it's a cool thing. I, just, I, I, I feel like I've seen it multiple times when I felt personally like the seahorse might have been afraid or whatnot, but maybe maybe I'm mistaken and maybe it's typically always a look at my muscles kind of thing. You never know. <laughs> Marina, did you? Well, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to ask if I cut Marina off, did you have another thought or question? Um, I did have another question, sort of on a bit of a different um, sure. note. Does anyone actually let their tanks have a little bit of natural sunlight in the morning or anything like that? And does that affect the colour of your seahorses? Absolutely. It was interesting. We set up once a system of 10 tanks with the tank tanks running from the window into the interior of a room and... The seahorses that were closest to the window were more colorful and grew faster. The next tank was behind that tank, but similar results. And each tank that we got further away from the window, the less color and the, the slower they grew. That really makes me... Hey. I'm sorry, go ahead, Marina. I was just going to say... Um... There you go. I guess I've sort of noticed with all my fish, fresh and salt water and seahorses and other fish in general, they all tend to just like the sunlight. And I guess yes. I'm not really sure if that's me sort of um, sort of pushing human emotions onto the fish. Right. Or, um, but they really do just seem to enjoy it. And I wonder if there's, I guess, a bit of benefit in letting them have that. I'm good. Well, you know, I, I gave a talk once at uh, a club across the state, and one of the guys in the club came up to me, and we were, had been discussing lighting. And he, what he did was, is he put a skylight in his house over his aquarium. Now, this was a very large aquarium. I forgot how many hundred gallons it was, but this, the skylight was built intentionally to put direct sunlight on the tank. And he said that tank exploded. The corals took off. They grew three times faster. They were much more colorful, much more healthier. And the whole, whole tank did fantastic after he got it set to where it got natural sunlight. I was going to pipe in. I mean, it makes oh. sense. It... Go ahead, Marina. I was just going to say, I guess it makes sense. It's quite hard for us to sort of replicate the ocean in a glass box. I mean... The sun is the light they have, you know, in the wild. Yeah, the, you know, there's a certain amount of UV that's in there. I was uh, just going to, I was, that yeah. We really can't, we really can't replicate in the aquarium environment. And there's different types of UV rays. So it, you know, now that we've gone to LEDs, LED lighting is, is a lot different than, you know, fluorescent. Fluorescent, of course, is much different than incandescent. Um, I, I don't, I'm not a lighting expert, but I just know that we still can't replicate the sunlight. We've got all kinds of different lights and different color lights and different dials we can do, but I don't think anything replaces natural sunlight. And I was just going to pipe in very quickly that I'm going to try to find the article once we're done. I know I say that guys, but I'm really going to try to find it and link it when we're done. And Cheryl Taylor, if you watch this later, I know you and I have discussed a scientific study that dealt with sunlight and how it actually, you know, there's debate about it, but many people believe that it does, it, you know, has to do with the strength of the bones of the fish and, and uh, all sorts of things that sunlight definitely does benefit. And I would agree, fresh and saltwater fish, um, for sure, for sure. I think we're making you know they, big the, waves, though. Right, but the, the big problem, the reason that most people don't use natural sunlight is that many people run into algae problems with it being too much light? Sure. I've seen I've seen in the macroalgae groups quite a few extremely gorgeous systems, um, but they're in like <laughs> way different areas than where I live. <laughs> so they have a completely different situation where they can possibly collect uh, clean natural salt water and you know do water changes as they see fit and they've got the natural sun beating down that 
you know, is, is nourishing and doing tremendously good things, but I'm just not in that situation. So, you know, I've played with lighting, uh, the fake lighting, and I can definitely say that I've watched the seahorses change colors based on the spectrum, based on whether it was a freshwater light or a, you know, a saltwater light in the, the newer lights that are coming out that, you know, supposedly do include UV rays, I just feel have uh, made a good impact. Uh, anyone who wants to answer, um, do you think that the new lights with the UV are even hitting on anything here? Or do you think it, there's just, it's not even close? Dan? I don't think that uh, artificial light, I think artificial light's many times better than it used to be, but I don't think it's anywhere close to the same effect as natural light. Gotcha. All right, well, I wanted to say a quick hi to uh, Ken and Jill. I know who you are. Um, and Heather and anyone else who's jumping in, feel free to ask any questions or join the room if you'd like. Um, I think we're doing a pretty good job of covering color. Marina, did you have, I think I just saw a question come up. Did you have another question though, Marina, that I cut you off? Or did you get it? Um, no questions on um, color that I can think of for now, but I'll try and think of some more. <laughs> well, don't feel pressured. We just enjoy you being here. And if you have questions about anything else, um, as I've mentioned to anyone watching, this is also a situation where even if you're having a problem with a seahorse or something exciting, your new babies, whatever, if you jump in and use your camera to show us, you know, we'd be happy to share in that experience with you or help you with anything that might be going on. So even if you're off topic, we're always here. That's why we come is to be a community gathering so you can ask any questions. And I, hey, Chris Carey, we hope you're doing swell and that you can join soon, but we know you're super busy. Hope everything's going good there. Okay. And Philosophish, we love that you come and hang out and just listen. No, I don't mean to pressure people to join. I just want to always make sure that people know that they can. Um, and I thought I saw a question. Okay, so do you think seahorses are getting vitamin D from natural sunlight? Dylan Roberts asked. Um, I'll, I'll personally say I, I'm not, I don't have enough knowledge to answer that question, but that was what the article kind of focused on, um, which I will try to find in link. Did anybody have a thought on that? Without, like... I, I don't know the answer to it. Um, you know, it's a question that's in my mind, but I really don't have an answer. Well, I, I don't know if sort of um, kind of soak up vitamin D in the same way um, we do. So I don't necessarily know that they're getting vitamin D, but I would guess that they're definitely getting something. Good point. Because they don't now. How does um, actually really quickly? Just because that you just brought on a good point. Um, seahorse skin is very different than fish scales. Um, anyone who wants to, but I'm kind of looking at you, Dan, because <laughs> I always look at Dan. Sorry, guys, he's so great. But uh, can you tell us a little bit about how seahorse skin is different than fish, regular fish? I'm sorry, one more time. I always put you on the spot, I know it. Just a very brief description of how seahorses and their skin differ from normal fish and scales and how that affects them. Well, well technically seahorses have scale, a scale, okay. and, but they're fused scales. They're not like regular fish scales. So, um, and there is skin, there is a, a dermal layer that's below that, but um, it's very different from regular fish. It's um, is that not why seahorses have so many bacterial issues with their skin? Well, I, I think that's part of it, but I also think the other part of it is, is that they don't swim around and move around like regular fish do. So they're more susceptible to things landing on them and being able to, uh -huh. you know, eventually penetrate. Um, I, I do believe their skin is quite tough. Um, but it's... It's weird because I read conflicting things on the external layer of the seahorses to where some refer to it as a skin, others refer to it as a fixed scale system. Over the Where place. the scales are fused together. 
I had not even heard that, so thank you for sharing it. I had always heard of it described as skin. And your um, your talk just reminded me when I first started off with seahorses, I used to freak out because the seahorses would let, like, um, I can't even, oh, what are those, not snails, but like the teeny tiny sluggish type saltwater things. Okay, I can't even think of the name, so I'm not doing a very good story. But this, I would see them, like, crawling on the seahorse. And I'd be like, oh, my gosh, is this a parasite? Is something terrible going on? And the seahorse, if they got irritated, they'd just go up and get it off of them. But <laughs> they didn't care. They let things crawl all over them. It was <laughs> whatever. So I've personally seen well, that happen. Right. Well, one of the things is people will often notice is seahorses will get up in the flow. They'll, they'll hang out oh, above yeah. an airstone airline whatever and i you know i i relate that to you and i taking a shower because of their you know somewhat sedentary nature they get in that flow it blows the stuff off of them well and i've seen like actual seahorses in the wild they don't you know we talk about how they're typically found in the shallow murky non not really high flow areas but you know, even Paul has has uh, posted many videos of seahorses way out on that ocean floor. They're not as, uh, you know, as weak as we think, and they do like flow for darn sure because my seahorses flow dance. <laughs> and you might call it a shower. I call it dancing. They get in the flow, and they literally twirl around each other and love it. Were you going to say something, Marina? I thought I heard Marina. Sorry. Okay. Well, I can tell you this. I've actually gotten... Dwarf seahorses. I found them in, in areas where the current was running at four knots. Wow! Um, you know, there, there's areas where I have found seahorses where the flow was so strong you couldn't believe that they were actually there. And how were they there? I mean, I know you don't know, but I mean, that's crazy. Yeah, but it's you know, it right there next to the Smithsonian Institute here in Fort Pierce. There's a boat ramp, and it's the um, the lagoon exits out the inlet right there, and it's probably one mile from the uh, entrance to the inlet itself. And the current goes through there; it cooks during peak tide. And you know, we can go right out there in the grass, right off of that spot, and sometimes catch uh, dwarfs. And you know, I, if you go down to um, West Palm Beach, um, one of the bridges where they do a lot of diving. The current there is so strong, they have to go down at slack tide. They got a 45 minute window. And if they try to dive past that, the current's so strong, it'll take the divers either inland or out or out to sea. And that place is loaded with seahorses. That's so crazy to me. So crazy. Uh, just check in the comments really quickly. I saw um, Jill said, my seahorse fry do better when natural sunlight shines upon them. Their colors brighten up. That's really interesting. Um, Dan, have you done any, yep. have you, have you done experiments like with fry in the sunlight or just with adults or all of right. the above? No, that was, no, that uh, thing I was telling you about with the tanks near the window, that was a case oh. where the fry grew much faster and more colorful in the natural sunlight than further in the room. That's interesting about the growing faster too. I just, and, and I appreciate that Marina pointed out that it probably wasn't them soaking up vitamin D the same way we do, but something's going on for sure. Um, and Ray, did you ever do, but, go ahead, Rick, Dan. Vitamin S. What's vitamin S? That's a seahorse vitamin. Oh, okay. Works for me. Ray, have you ever had any, uh, or set up any, um, aquariums with natural sunlight or? Have you just not been able no. to do that? No. No. There, none of them are in there. The one behind me here is the closest. There's a narrow window beside the front door that uh, lets some light in, but uh, as far as reaching the tank, if all the lights are out in the house here and there's light coming in there, the tank will get some light, but it's nothing that, uh, you know, nothing other than just some ambient. Gotcha. If I was to build a new facility for breeding seahorses, I wouldn't want to put in a glass roof, but what I would do is put in sun tubes to have natural light coming in on top of everything. Hmm, that's interesting. I'm, I, I was I was merely going to say that I've never been able to, you know, had the ability to actually set up a natural light 
system. Um, I've mentioned many online that I've seen that are amazing. But in my macroalgae seahorse tank that, uh, you know, hit the magazine and was like my favorite tank ever and was so beautiful with so many different uh, macroalgae, I was using one of the freshwater plant lighting systems, um, which seemed to do better for not only the macros, but the seahorses. Um, unfortunately, I can't tell you why. <laughs> I just know that it did work better. Um, so I'm sure this plays a big part, and I guess we need anybody who watches this to share your thoughts and opinions. Maybe maybe we'll get some more studies done and some scientific feedback about this soon. That would be awesome. And even hobbyist um, experiments like Marina's orange paper around the tank. That's great, you guys. The only way we can learn about these kind of things and you know advance in this hobby is by people just like us doing experiments and figuring things out. So cheers. Yeah, but remember too, when you're doing experiments that you need to do replicates. And I don't mean the controlled, you know, triple blind replicate type thing. I mean, you need to be able to do it multiple times with multiple specimens to really verify your hypotheses that it's not just a one-off thing. Sure. And so just what, what you're saying basically is if you're going to do a tank, you know, with the orange backing or whatever. I've done a couple myself and wasn't doing what you're talking about, so they weren't, you know, actual data because you have to have a group that's not with the orange backing of the same species, same batch, et cetera, right? Is that basically what you're getting at? More or less. Okay. I mean, you know, it's sometimes I get people that will come in and argue with me because they had a tank and they had a seahorse, and what they did was, and that's the... You know, they think that's the end all answer and that's not necessarily the case. Um, you know, a lot, most of my things are based upon seeing things happen many, many, many times. And sometimes when I do something and something works, I go, great, I figured it out. And then I go to replicate it and it doesn't work again. Um, so sometimes things can be a one off circumstance in terms of, you know, doing something, whether it's treating an animal or or trying to get them to change color or how fast they grow or, mm. you know, certain foods, et cetera. It, it, you need to be able to do it multiple times to show that that is indeed a thing that will normally work. Such as your minis and your piebalds, right? Because you've done it multiple times with both. Well, the, no, the minis are a first time. Oh. The piebalds, I've, most people know I've been doing piebalds for a couple of years. Sure. And I'm curious, have you gotten any feedback from anyone who bought a mini that they... I don't know, grew, grew bigger than expected? Or have you had anybody no. talk about the fry that came from them? No, but I shipped out two minis today to a customer who specifically wanted the smallest that I could give her. And the, both of them were about two and a quarter inches in length. Wow. And they're 14 months old. Can't wait to see how that, that turns out. Sorry. The smallest I had in the tank. Now, most of them are somewhere between three and four inches. And I have a couple that have gotten a little bit bigger than that. But, you know, I've, I've also been very clear with people that, you know, I do expect them to grow a little bit. I just don't expect them to grow very much. And you got to remember, too, I used to sell a reckless that used to, you know, get up there typically at seven, eight inches of the males. And some of my own specimens would reach 10 inches. So it's, you know, that's a huge contrast. Sure. And I was just reading the comments. Not to be rude, sorry. Trying to keep up with two things. And um, Hunter and Philosophish are both talking about they're wanting to start their seahorse tanks. So, again, I'm sure you guys have done lots of research. I've seen at least Philosophish here many times. But if you have any questions, um, I saw someone comment that they were kind of scared. And what we really try to do here is show that keeping seahorses isn't scary as long as you do research and, you know, set up the proper way. So if you have any questions, even if it's not what we're talking about, don't forget, feel free to ask. All right. <laughs> I have to keep saying it, you know. <laughs> but I, I'll say this, you know, from my experience, and I've sold seahorses now since, I've been doing it since 2003. Um, back in the early days, we had many people who told, tried to discourage new people from getting seahorses or wouldn't sell to new people because they didn't have experience and they're afraid they were going to do the seahorses in. My experience has been that most people starting off that do research, and I'm not saying become experts, I'm saying do the, the research of what they need to set up are much more successful than the average reefer that decides to do seahorses. 
So mm. just because you're new doesn't mean you can't successfully do it. And most often you'll do it better than others because of one, you're, you're not preconceived with bad habits and bad notions from other things in the tank. And two, most of the time they do their research. Oh, sorry. I was trying to sneak and open a wine bottle. It didn't work out for me. Um, and I know Marina uh, has mentioned freshwater and saltwater fish. So she's obviously done others. And I certainly started off with freshwater uh, planted discus tank, moved to the reefing, and then found out about seahorses. But I was never like a long-term reefer or whatnot before I started. But Dan, you're basically saying that... Um, People who have less experience than a long-time reefer might do better. Is that? Oh, wait, really fast. Ray, what are you showing us? A pair of barbs. Okay, really quickly. I just wanted to show what Ray was showing us, and then we'll go along with that question. Uh, I missed it, didn't I? No, here we go. Here we go. Sorry, guys. I got to do two 20 things at once here. Oh, beautiful barbs. That's my favorite seahorse species. I love them. Love them. And Ray's gonna, Ray is going to end up being our master educator on how to share pictures and screen share. Yay! I've been waiting for the day for Ray to take his place as I the master. I just went my website and then went to that picture of the barb. I love it. Well, it's working. We see your beautiful barbs. Did you name your seahorses, Ray? No. Oh. <laughs> I named my seahorses, y'all. You know, after 18 years with all the seahorses, I haven't had the numbers that Dan's had, but uh, I've been at it as long as he has. He just learned a lot more than I did. Gotcha. <laughs> he, I, I wouldn't say all that, Ray. You've been a help to many, and you've learned tons. So I wouldn't exactly agree with that statement, but your barbs are beautiful and uh, very cool that we're figuring out how to work this room thing. Thank you. Um, and now I'll um, – were you going to say something, Dan? I feel like I cut you off. Sorry. Did we forget? What no, I got I – a question from a customer who's watching that didn't want to join, but had sure. a question. Sure, so I was of course. It. Okay. Are we not sharing the question? Personal question? No. Well, they didn't want to come on, so. No I'm, problem. I'm not going to. It, they don't want to come on and be public with it. I won't go public with it. Sure. Of course. I thought you meant in the group. I'm, I apologize. Um, no, no, no. They, I, apparently they're watching, but uh, not participating in this actual stream which we also appreciate you know you guys just watching is cool okay yeah, i'm really trying to fake this but opening the wine bottle anyways we appreciate it and you know any any questions you don't mind being shared put them in the comments otherwise you know of course we won't go there all right but i felt like i cut you off i felt like we were talking about something anybody in the comments remind me what were we saying before ray dazz dazzled us with his beautiful uh barbori picture and if not, I'm curious, um, what is your favorite species to anyone? Because we have a couple of uh, viewers who are looking at setting up seahorse tanks, not sure where anyone's from, or and et cetera, and obviously different captive bred species are uh, um, available around different places in the world. But Ray, what do you think is the easiest species to raise? And Ray's showing us these beautiful pictures. What are you showing us, Ray? <laughs> One of my homemade skimmers that uh, I had the uh, air cranked up a bit too much. Oh my goodness! <laughs> and I'm, it... just, I'm just playing around with this uh, this thing there now. I didn't know it was there until you were talking about it. Trying to get Dan uh, onto it, and uh, so I'm really just playing around now. And I wanted to see if something that wasn't on uh, on the chrome uh, tab. Mm -hmm. to see if I could put something that was just off my desktop. And it worked, eh? And I was just, yeah, it worked. And you, wait, actually, I'm curious, guys. I will look at the questions in just a second. But I, when I was trying to screen share, I couldn't put something off my desktop. I had something literally up, and it didn't work. I wonder, well, maybe it's because I have my video off or something. But, huh. So you just click that button, and you get what? <laughs> If you click on that share screen, you get a share screen page up. Uh huh. And then you can select, it says your entire screen, application window, Chrome tab. Yeah, I got, I got all that. It's just like I've got a picture open and it won't let me choose that. Well, if you, 
Yeah. With our application window, if you open up uh, something that you want and it's not on the Chrome tab, uh, like oh, for look. me right now, I've got. Uh, I just figured it my out. Email <laughs> is there. Not that 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 I that I. So if you open up something, it'll show up under application window, and then you can click on it. And you guys can now all see my uh, piebald in the uh, in the bottom window because I just figured out how to screen share. Apparently, because I'm streaming and restreaming and restreaming three more times to three different places, my computer just takes a minute. But I guess we're uh, I don't know we're figuring it out as we go. So cool, very cool. Um, okay, let's see uh, what other questions we have. Um, Jill says her minis are doing well. The female is a lot smaller than the male. Love them. Um, I'm curious, Dan, have you noticed uh, a difference in size based on sex with the minis? Um, you mean if one's smaller than the other? Right. I mean, males are typically larger than females, at least in every experience I've ever had. But, um... Do you right. expect them to yeah, grow I, at I different rates? Different. Right. I see the proportion as being just scaled down pretty much the same. Hmm. Okay. This is what happens when you crank up your skimmer really well. Hang on. Let me try to put you full screen one sec here. Okay. Here we go. One, two. And Dan's, Dan's being cool with the phone. We can't see it very well. What yeah. is that? I know. The damn lights. <laughs> That's bubbles all outside. No way. That's outside your house? <laughs> With mine, that box is uh, a foot. Uh, it's a one foot cube. Wow. That one of the camera that I showed? Yeah. That box yep. is a foot in all directions. Wow. So that's how much foam it was. Dang. The skimmer is six foot tall, and that's, that, that box is on the top of it. You know, I sold, I bought a skimmer and I turned on and sold it, but um, I had one, I forget the damn name of it, but it required a two horsepower pool pump to run it. And originally I was going to set up one massive sump system and it ended up being too big for what I could use. And it was just too much electricity just to run the skimmer. I just used uh, air it was counter current and my air stones I make out of uh basswood that I get from uh, a hardwood place here in town. And uh, I cut them up, they're seven inches long. They're two inches uh, uh, square. And uh, the hole is seven, eight diameter bore. Well, th this skimmer was six feet tall and the, um, the collection basket, I think, holded around three gallons or so. Yeah. It was too big. But I don't have it up here. I haven't got the room up here. They're only in uh, my basement tank. This tank doesn't have a skimmer on it. All of mine do run skimmers. Well, I look at the price of the skimmers and I figured, well, with me, uh, I've got water that I make up my own, uh, uh, my own formula and I mix it half and half with into an ocean, so it doesn't cost me a lot for the water, and it's a lot uh, easier for me to do more water changes than uh, spend a pile of money for a skimmer. We probably pay half a can here what you would pay down there for anything we buy. So if you pay $100 down there, we're going to pay at least $150 for it here. No, I get that. Sorry for anyone watching. I'm kind of trying to Skimmer's play while they're here. talking. Sorry, go ahead, Dan or Ray. The skimmers around here, uh, I haven't uh, really looked at any prices lately, but the last time I saw anything um, posted on one of the uh, Canadian uh, forums, uh, it was used and they wanted 550 bucks for it. It's called a Magnus or something, I forget for sure but it didn't seem to be anything special and uh, for you with that kind of money, there's no way. And especially when I had so many bloody tanks that uh, I would have had to 
uh, Y1 breach tank that wasn't too practical. And uh, these skimmers, uh, I was able to make them up easy and uh, I bought the uh, air pump. Uh, oh God, I can't even remember. I can't think of the name of them now, but uh, the air pumps themselves are quite economical and they're silent and uh, they last forever. I've had these, the two that I have here, uh, ooh, at least 25 years now. And I put rebuilt kits in each one of them uh, once in that time. And uh, in terms of Canadian dollars, uh, it was something like about 150 bucks to buy each one. So I couldn't argue with that. Sure. Yep. Okay, um, guys, I'm trying to keep these uh, streams a little bit shorter so that uh, people will come more and enjoy more without having to search through all the information. So um, any other, and, and Ray, I didn't mean to cut you off because I definitely want to talk skimmers more. And if, if, okay. I can't, if I can't connect with the person that was going to talk about seahorse safe corals, we will do that on our own because I had a bunch of images and et cetera to show you to talk about macros and gorgonians and what works and what doesn't and uh, kind of touch base with Ray more about his leather and et cetera. But um, so anyways, we're getting there. Obviously, this is working, which is very cool. Was there any other questions that I've missed or any other conversation about color or anything else we need to cover tonight, guys? And Dylan and anyone else who, who is watching in the comments, if you have ideas for topics for a future week or if you have questions, please just know, you know, I keep saying it, but please know we want, you know, to talk about what you want to learn. So absolutely, we love when you come and, and ask questions and share. So anything we can do for you, you let us know. But Marina, did you have anything else or you wanted to? I know um, I, I always wait, put you on the spot. <laughs> Go ahead, Dan. Philo, uh, well, I can't say it right. Um, it's philoso, is, philoso, is there, like uh, philosophy. Size is a good setup for minis. There you go. Okay, philosophy. Never mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the correct answer is, at least from my recommendation, I always recommend starting off with a minimum of a 30 gallon tank. Um, Technically, you can do smaller. The problem is when you go smaller than 30 gallons, it's very difficult to get the right filtration equipment on a smaller tank. And to me, a 30 gallon is the smallest tank I would go. Having said that, I wouldn't be afraid to put two pairs of minis in a 30 gallon, where I normally recommend one pair for every 25 to 30 gallons. Yes, and, no, and there's never a problem if the question's already been asked. Um, always ask questions. That's what we want is to help people. So, and share, each, share information with each other. I think he asked earlier, and I think we just missed it. I'm so sorry if we did. We get to going, and sometimes I do miss questions. Always feel free to ask again, please. Um, are there any other tips, actually, really quickly, Dan, that you would have for, like, are the tips different for minis versus regular, say, Erectus. And uh, before you answer, I'll just say that there's always in Seahorse Sources group files that document the, you know, how to set up and what you need and et cetera. But is there any difference between minis and a typical Seahorse, Dan? Not really. They eat the same foods. The only difference is they're smaller. Um, otherwise, everything else is pretty much the same. So... The, the only thing is being smaller that sometimes you can pay with a few more in a tank than you would with the larger, larger cousins or the larger specimens of the same species. And the coolest part is that they're not the dwarf seahorse, which requires live foods. I mean, they're, they're the small, cute ones, but they're not. Now, um, really curious though, with dwarf seahorses, they typically have that really iridescent, beautiful coloration, right? Is that a correct statement? Uh, Dorsey, no, they can be all over the place with colors just like everybody else. Really? 
have have now I have no yeah. I have no experience with dwarf seahorses, folks. So uh, these are questions I have to ask anyone who's kept them. I uh, wish Lucy was here too. But Dan, have you noticed? Do they get the extravagant colors of the bigger species? Like, do you have yellow dwarf seahorses or red dwarf seahorses? Not often. Not often. Okay. They can. They can, but not often. I mean, at one time we were producing. I don't know. I was producing about four or five hundred every three months out of a system. Um, the, the the colors can be all over the place, just like with the other seahorses. They have a propensity to be more neutral tone because of the environment they come from. Um, but I've seen them in reds. I've seen them in um, you know greens and purplish colors and uh, orange tones and uh, everything else, black, you know, almost a white type color, um, bone colored all over the place. Gotcha. Wow. Okay. Well, Philosophish said, when you were a kid, you got dwarf seahorses out of the back of a boy's life magazine. They didn't live long. And uh, Dan, I, 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 or if anyone has another thing they want to chat about, Ray's showing us some cool pictures again. <laughs> Ray, we're going to have to show your entire, like, scrubber uh, systems uh, some someday on this channel, uh, now that we know how to share pictures. But, um, now I forgot what I was going to ask, Dag, on it. Okay, um, Dan, just... I was, just... I was talking about Angustus earlier. What, Ray? And uh, that was just to show one there is kind of a color, and the other one's pretty well whitish. Okay, wait, I'm trying to get on to just you here. You said... What were you uh, showing us? I couldn't hear what you said. What did you say? Uh, I was talking about the Angustus color. Oh. Yeah. You know, in this picture here, the, the one there is kind of reddish, and then the one to the right of it is uh, pretty well whitish. And, and I'm curious, a question we had earlier was whether or not they typically change uh, based on their fellow seahorses. Um, obviously, the orangish, reddish, yellowish colored one was the male and the female just stayed white. Is that correct? Ray? Uh, this one did. The other female uh, was more of a yellow hmm. and the other male, um, I can't remember for sure on the other male. This is a long time ago when I had those Angustus. That was probably uh, 2005, I'm guessing. Well, it's still very interesting to me because now that you've kind of pointed that out, I can say that with my Barbori, I've seen my Erectus change colors like crazy. I've seen my Barbori go from light to dark shades, but they never steered away from that, you know, off-white color. Um, Reed Eye have gone to extremes of every different, so it's interesting to me that different species seem to change colors, and I definitely would love to see more research done into the sexes because I feel like my females change color less. I know that the males are the aggressors and the quarters and the, you know, all the other, you know, the more aggressive, whatever. But it's interesting and I wonder, you know, obviously it's for attracting a mate and maybe scaring off whatever, um, but it's just interesting to me, I agree with you, your picture that the females seem to stay the same color more often, um, so. And uh, I did I did really quickly, though, but very cool that you figured out how to... I would disagree with that. Okay, tell us why, Dan. You don't think the males change colors more well, than the females? my experience is... No, I don't. Okay. Um, I found, in many cases, the females to be more colorful than the males. Um, the, the Barbary, I've had pink, orange, um, green... And what was the other color? It was a weird color. I don't remember. Hmm. But I've, I've we had them come in once when we brought them up from Seahorse Australia. They all came in pink. Wow, and that's so I cool. Remember the person who I brought them up with? We were selling them, and you know everybody wanted them because they were all pink, and they didn't stay pink. Of course. Um, not for any of the customers and not for us. Uh, they they changed. But it was real cool when I saw one turn to a, a greenish color. 
Wait, really quick. I don't mean to interrupt, but what in the world, what kind of environment do you think made them turn pink? That's just, I can't even imagine. Uh, I don't know. I've only been able to re recreate it once, and I'm not sure how I did it. Um, <laughs> you know, Barbary, as you said, have a typically more of a bone type color. Sure. And it's very difficult to get them to color up. I have had them turn into pale yellows, but not a true bright yellow. Mm. Although I have seen pictures of a bright yellow Barbary. Sure. I, uh, one. I have one female, with the smallest one of the barbs, and she's always the same color. She never changes like the others do. She's always that pale yellow. I was at, yeah. I was actually going to. She's always the small. Uh, she's the smallest one. I was actually going to agree because, Dan, um, one of the pair of Barbori I got from you, my female was yellow. Um, the other three that I got from you were the the beautiful, sparkly, gorgeous, but clearish white color. But my female was yellow. She never changed. Yep. So I guess I, I, guess I uh, will backtrack on what I said. I wouldn't say that the males are always the ones that are more colorful, but just in my personal experience – the males change colors more because like my yellow female never changed. She was always yellow. Do you know what I mean? Does that make, uh, you can still disagree, but okay. That's, that's my, my two cents y'all. <laughs> I don't know that I would disagree with that. Yeah. I don't know that I would dis disagree with that. I'm just, I'd have to really sit down and think about it because I've never tried to uh, look at it from that perspective. And Marina. But I've had males that never changed too. And so I, I personally can't say that females or males uh, change more than the other. Um, I guess I never thought of it that way because there wasn't anything that was obvious to me. But I've had, like this female here, I've probably had other females. I just can't think of it just at the moment. But I know there's been males that uh, never, ever change. Sure. See, my males, my males uh, always have. They always regarding have. regarding the abstract. Sorry. No. I've had all of mine change color. Um, I've had all of my seahorses change color and um, across different species as well. But I find the males change more um, sort of temporary changes, like um, when they're mating and that sort of a thing. But in terms of actually sort of somewhat permanently changing their color, I found all of them just do. I think you put it best, Marina. And when that's, you're doing that's... mating, uh, don't you find the female at the same time? Ray, can you say that again? You got kind of muffled because I talked over you. Don't you find the female? Sorry. Don't you find that the female, when they're doing the mating dance, don't you find the female changes the coloration at the same time the male does? Um, nowhere near as much. It might just be my seahorses or my tank, but I found it. Um, nowhere near as much and male one in particular will actually be white and stay white sort of even for a few days agree hmm. so ray you're saying that your females do change when they're courting yeah they change but uh, uh it doesn't have to be the same like uh with the barbs uh the male might go bright uh, brown and uh, the female might go yellow. Hmm. Sure. I've kind of experienced the same as Marina where the male... So it's just a... Sorry, go ahead, Ray. Yeah, it's just a temporary change though when they're doing that. Sure. Uh, I get more permanent changes uh, if I change the tank around, especially if I... Uh, if I take out a piece of live rock or something, uh, then uh, they seem to lighten up. And conversely, if I add live rock to a tank, then uh, they go darker. Sure. <laughs> Dan's pulled out uh, something that's not wine. We're going to pretend it's water. <laughs> um, okay, guys. Well, oh. <laughs> I, w I was merely going to, you know. Real, real quick note, if I could. Yes, please, Dan. Uh Philo Fish, uh, with where you're located, uh, Long Island Sound is full of seahorses. And if you had the means to, if you were to search around real hard, you should be able to find them out there in the sound. I know you're closer to the edge, but um, 
you still, if you get up there in the uh, estuaries, you should be able to find some if you hunt long and hard enough, particularly at the latter part of the summer months. Uh, great answer, but actually that's what I was going to ask before I got off, off topic, as, as, as usual. Um, could you kind of um, finish us up, Dan, with a little bit of an explanation about why um, people who have had a bad experience, say, years ago with seahorses in the back of a magazine or whatnot, might have a much, much better experience buying captive bred seahorses versus, you know, obviously someone can go collect their own, but can you explain why it's kind of, um, go ahead. Sure. Please. Well, the first thing is, is back when that took place, there wasn't uh, many people having a lot of success with seahorses. Uh, we've, in the 15, well, 16 years that I've been doing this, um, we've gone from where people expected to have seahorses for a couple years to where I've had a customer have the same seahorse for 11 years. And the average experience keeper should be expecting five years plus out of a, out of a seahorse in a captive environment. The, what we've learned in terms of taking care of the seahorses has improved drastically in terms of what's needed. There's, there's a lot of misconceptions early on about how much flow, how, what to feed them. Uh, the other thing with the advent of captive breeding is we now feed them frozen foods. And th the other big thing that comes about is that buying captive bred versus wild caught, generally you're going to expect a good quality specimen if you buy captive bred where when you buy wild caught even though it's a good specimen when collected the handling process it can stress them out to where they're not necessarily healthy when you get them the second thing is is that the captive bred have been raised in a captive environment they don't know anything else a wild caught specimen is coming from the wild and suddenly put into a cage and sometimes they just don't adapt very well. So there, there's a huge difference between captive and wild caught. And there's also a huge difference in what we do today versus even 10 years ago and go back 20 years ago is even more drastic in terms of the differences. I think your uh, calculations are wrong. You, you were talking 16 years. I think you've been in as long as I have. As I can remember, uh, you back in 2003. Well, Ray, I'm handicapped. I only have 10 fingers. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you guys would talk for longer. I've got a daughter yakking at me on the side. I'm sorry. But um, or um, Marina or Ray, either one of you, did you have any thoughts about why, like, buying captive bread just – like, I have personal thoughts, and I've shared them so many times, so I wanted to give anybody else a, a second to, to speak. Marina, are you, do you um, buy captive bread? No judgment here, just thoughts. Um, yeah, I would only ever buy captive bread and only ever recommend buying captive bread. Um, I just think in general with fish where possible... I think it's the sort of nicer option. Like even with clowns, I would never buy wild clowns. Captives are so readily available. But I think with seahorses in particular, um, especially like a, a wild caught adult seahorse, trying to transition its diet onto, you know, frozen, and lived in the ocean its whole life, eating live food. Um, I think it just makes sense that that's going to be a bit of a harder transition for the seahorse. Um, then I think there's all the stress of it being pulled out of, uh, like, the ocean, like you said, um, popped in a cage. And just the risk of disease and how it's being handled. Like, I think most um, seahorse breeders from breeding, breeding systems, they're breeding healthy seahorses. Um, you're probably going to get a pretty healthy seahorse that's been raised by a breeder opposed to, um, I guess, a seahorse that's been collected from the wild with a bunch of other fish, who knows what else, and is transferred from 
sort of one facility to the next to the next then ends up at the local fish shop. I think even cutting out um, sort of all the stops along the way is also eliminating a lot of chances for the seahorse to pick up diseases or yeah. um, just be stressed out in general. Agree 110%. Uh, MACNA has taken a, a really a shine to featuring captive breeding and sustainable collection and et cetera and everything you're talking about, the supply chain and how there are so many problems with the supply chain. With seahorses especially since, you know, there are certain species that are considered endangered and, you know, uh, you know China, whatever, we're not going to get into it, but there are just so many reasons to buy captive bred. It's also, support, also supporting the breeders who are working to breed these guys in captivity. And I agree with everything you said. You know, not as many diseases are coming from a, a breeding facility. It, uh, you hit them all. You did, a, you did a great job covering it. It broke up a little bit. I'm just so glad you made so many good points. Dan also, Ray also. Um, and, and I'm a, a huge person who, who really supports captive breeding and buying captive bred. But we don't judge here and, you know, um, Heck, Lucy and working with different scientists in a collection project um, almost came across a new species. So, you know, there's a place for everyone. But if you're able to do captive bread, I absolutely am a proponent of that and for all the reasons we just covered. Okay. All right. I, would, I don't want to go on and on. Um, was there any other questions I missed? Go ahead, Marina. I was also going to say, I don't necessarily think that seahorses are harder to care for than other fish, but I do think that they're different. And I know a lot of the time being held in storage facilities or whatever, where um, hundreds if not thousands of other fish, even sometimes um, just in general local fish shops in the aquarium, sometimes they can't necessarily get specific care that they need, the multiple feeding, the uh, probably extra water changes like that, that just are sometimes, I think the seahorse might miss out on, miss out on because they're going somewhere, I guess, that's not designed for seahorses, seahorses it's designed for fish. Sure. Uh, she... And I think that's another benefit with having. She made an, another excellent point. I'm just going to reiterate really quick. Marina, I'm Marina. I'm just going to reiterate really quickly because for some reason it's breaking up a bit. So she's just making the point that um, seahorses do are not more difficult, as she pointed out. They just need special care, like different than other fish. And when you're buying a fish from a store that's maybe got, you know, multiple different types of fish, in it and you're buying a seahorse from that store they're not maybe not getting the care that they would typically need and um you know buying from a breeder you're getting a, a seahorse that was bred specifically and cared for properly with the multiple feedings and etc um did i did i cover that well sorry i don't know why it's squeaking so bad on your end <laughs> uh yeah i think it sums it up pretty well Okay, well, you, you made the point, and it was a fantastic point. <laughs> so, and I do think that the longer that we have these rooms go on, guys, that uh, especially with streaming, the more they get kind of squeaky and, and et cetera. Plus, Ray's looking like it's past his bedtime. So, <laughs> I'm going to call it for tonight. Um, but we really appreciate anyone who has come and joined. If I missed any questions. What, what Ray? Chris made it in. Chris is in? Chris Chris isn't in. Well, he's posted. Oh. <laughs> well, Chris is amazing, and I hope that Chris... Yeah. Oh, and Lucy's watching now, too. Lucy, we were talking about you earlier, and we're hoping that you would jump in the group. Um, I'm hoping maybe next week uh, we can talk macros. I'm not going to say that set the topic yet until I get some feedback from all of you. But I have my presentation ready, and if Lucy's willing to join, I would love to talk macros and et cetera. But 
Lucy, we talked earlier about your beautiful yellow seahorse that uh, just stays beautifully yellow all the freaking time, and everyone's jealous. So we want to know your tricks and tips. you got to join next week. But this is getting very squeaky, guys, So I, and it's nine, it's been going two hours. So much for me cutting it down, so I'm going to cut it for tonight. But next week, if you have any suggestions for topic, Chris, Carrie, we'd love to hear from you too. Just message me or post in Seahorse Sources group or on Seahorse Whisper Society page um, to let us know what topics you'd like discussed. And of course, as always, everyone will be welcome to join. But let me know if you like the way we're doing things now a little bit better, um, where more people can join. Marina obviously has stepped up and really, really helped out and joined uh, the past two weeks. So seems like it's easier. But I'll quit rambling, and I'll just let you guys say adieu, and then we will come back next week. Ray, Dan, Marina, say How goodbye. How do you pronounce that? <laughs> adieu. <laughs> I'm probably goodbye. saying it wrong. Goodbye, Ray, Dan, Marina. Goodbye. <laughs> Happy Wine Wednesday, y'all, and let's not, forget, let's not forget that it keeps going for a second. All right. Cheers. <laughs>